Chapter 16 is one of the shortest chapters that we're going to have, and I, I think it's great because that way we don't bore you to death right off the bat. Give me, I'll give you a brief introduction before we really get into it. Um, after about 1530 Common Era, there were what we call new sciences in Europe, and they began to question the older beliefs about the physical universe, and is the church really telling us the truth? It led to new methods of inquiry, which led to the development of actually astronomy and physics and biology and chemistry and geology and and even new institutions that supported this new scientific research. The scientific revolution, as it was called, gave rise to the theoretical breakthrough in explaining the physical universe as well as advancing practical knowledge such as people like the artists and the painters and the builders were using. They were building telescopes and microscopes and, and all kinds of devices. So this combination of scientific inquisitiveness and craft techniques encouraged technological developments that, well, would later be much more useful during the industrial age, industrialization age. So the new science did not mark a clean rupture with the old ways of thinking and the traditional religious thinking. Because most scientists of the 1600s remained essentially very religious. And they thought that their work was, well, it caused them some problems. They were trying to reconciliate the new scientific ways of seeing and learning and things of God. Their work was really, when you get right down to it, only accessible to a very, very small minority of extremely educated people who even had access to books. So that's you and I, the common folk, as they say, uh, would not have had access to it because we've been too busy trying to stay alive and make a living. Now, before we begin, I sincerely hope that you each have made a copy of your word list because that's suggested earlier. It's going to help you take notes, and everything on this word list will probably be either used in a question or as an answer to a question. And I've tried to keep it pretty much in the motion or the order of which you will hear it. So thus we begin our trip into history and exploration. Chapter 16 is called The New Science of the 17th Century, and Carol Cole and Carol Joshua Cole and Carol Sims are, of course, our text authors. Sometimes I have a little bit of problem with my PowerPoints. At the end of the introduction, we're going to tell you uh, some things that are going on that are going to lead into the chapter. Because the people are beginning to and willing to doubt. Uh, before you had to accept everything the church told you. I mean, this is what God says. I'm the representative of God on earth. I'm the Pope. I'm a priest. Uh, you accept what I say. We begin to see new theories and hypotheses. And of course, you've got Ptolemy and Hamlet and Copernicus. I have trouble with his name. Copernicus. Copernicus. Got it. Thank you. And Galileo. And, and it's a revision of knowledge. I mean, they're taking things that people in centuries past have thought and believed and wondered about, and they're going to add to them. So with this new science, you're going to create a new body of knowledge. You're going to create a new method of inquiry. And you're going to come up with a community of practitioners, practitioners, and institutions. So scientific revolution. What well, exactly was it? Well, the word egocentricity there simply means it's a sun-centered universe. In other words, prior to this time, everyone believed that the earth was the center of the universe and everybody revolved around us. That God created us, so we were the most important. And all of a sudden, we're getting these ideas that maybe this isn't true. You have the new mathematical and physics are going to be developed to try to handle some of this. New methods of inquiry. And science is going to become a distinct branch of knowledge, whereas before it had been kind of lumped in with the philosophy. So natural philosophy and the philosophy of nature are going to be separated. So scientific research. All of a sudden we're going to have the growth of research societies and institutions we're going to, in countries like France and, and England and Italy, we're going to build big buildings. And they're going to be brilliant theories. And sometimes these theories just like a puff of smoke in the wind. And sometimes a brilliant theory was strictly accidental. 
And strange as it may seem, even some educated women were beginning to participate in scientific debate because they worked with their husbands or they worked with their fathers. They weren't allowed so much in school. But the scientific struggled to reconcile their discoveries with their faith. Like I said, they were very religious people. And no one didn't want to believe in a god. So we've got to come up with ways to reconcile this. Artists and their observations of the natural world had created a lot of the inquiries. Uh, painters had been painting exactly what they saw very meticulously, and sculptors had been doing the same thing with some of these statues they, they created. And they had somehow come up with a magnetic compass, the printing press, gunpowder, and it's being to be a fascination with lights, like optics and lenses, and make things bigger and smaller, and you could see better. And it actually laid the groundwork for the invention of the telescope, the microscope, and even reading glasses long before Ben Franklin came around. So astrologers, with the aid of these new telescopes and microscopes, began to chart the heavenly bodies. And they discovered something very fascinating. These things moved. They weren't the same place all the time. But they all did believe that we lived in a natural world that was created by God. Johann Kepler had something called Neoplanetism, which this is basically what he was saying, that everything is created by God, that God is a, basically a big clockmaker. Now, the scientific revolution is part of what we call the Renaissance era. And during this Renaissance, the humanist people were beginning to place low values on natural philosophy as a science. But meanwhile, in lands where the Muslims have taken over, the Arabians are beginning to translate the Greek classics, and Europeans and Italians had not even started yet. And they began to rediscover some of the ancients of Ptolemy and Archimedes, and it's fascinating. They put a great deal of stock in the wisdom of the ancients, that they saw the universe as a giant machine. Like I said, God created this big clock. But we begin to see development between the artisans and the intellectuals. The, uh, the intellectuals wanted to know why the artist painted this way or why you built a building this way. And they started building machines for practical uses, using the laws of perspective and optics and alchemy and astrology. And all of a sudden, during this same time frame, we have what is called the Voyages of Discovery, where Portuguese and Spanish are going out into the ocean and discovering new lands and making colonies and discovering all kinds of things. I don't think this is just a couple of minutes long, but we'll give it a try. Sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. So I'm hoping it will work for you. Here we go, maybe. Maybe it's just my computer that's slow. I hope yours works a little faster. <laughs> Come on. Well, my little dot's moving. Here we go. One, two, cut the mess. Oh, yeah. I thought this was kind of cute. It may seem a bit sophomoric, but at least it will give you a little bit of an example. This is a good uh, suggestion.
power more important than truth? Hi, I'm Dr. Washington and I'll be teaching you about the scientific revolution. Before we begin I have to explain to you how the universe works. As you can see from the image above, the Earth sits in the center of the universe. It does not move, ever. The other planets all move in a circle around it. The Sun is the fourth planet away from Earth, and it moves in a circle around too. The stars are all in a ball that exists beyond the other planets. That makes perfect sense, right? Right? No? You don't agree? Well, maybe this will help explain it. You see, it is very simple, the Earth is in the middle and all the planets are spinning around it. I know some people will try to say that the Earth is moving too, but that is ridiculous. I mean, come on, I'm standing right here on the Earth and I don't feel it moving. I'm an adult and a teacher, I must be right. You're just kids, what could you possibly know? Okay, now that you know what it was like to live before the scientific revolution, let me admit I made that all up. Of course the Earth moves, and of course the Sun is in the middle. I just wanted you to see what the early scientists had to deal with. A revolution is a dramatic, meaning huge, change. It is like doing the total opposite of what you were doing before. Science changed from what people thought to what they observed. Instead of just saying something, because it made sense, they took the time to see it for themselves. They started doing actual experiments to test their ideas. Can you imagine science without experiments? The church is already fighting a war of ideas with the ongoing Protestant Reformation. The Congregation of the Inquisition is established in 1542 to suppress heretical ideas and police Catholic theology. Macabre devices such as the rack are used to extract confessions. Torture techniques like strapado, where the hands of the accused are tied behind their back as they're hoisted until their shoulders dislocate, lends additional persuasion to the unlucky accused. There is probably in all of human history nothing quite as terrifying as an interrogation in, in the in Inquisition. You start with the premise that you're guilty, and it's just a question of whether you can come to appreciate your guilt. One of the first thinkers to advocate heliocentrism is an outspoken monk named Giordano Bruno. Not only does Bruno embrace the sun as the center of our solar system, he believes in an infinite number of solar systems. In 1600, the Inquisition deals with him harshly. Giordano Bruno is declared to be a heretic, and he is not willing to compromise in any way with this belief. He asserts it to be truth, and he is tried, convicted, and burned at the stake. After Bruno is executed, many feel it's too dangerous to contradict church doctrine. These new scientists were challenging hundreds of years of tradition. Tradition that had come from the church. It was the church, for example, who taught that the earth was in the center and did not move. The church did not appreciate these scientists challenging them. They threatened the scientists with excommunication and even death if they did not follow the teachings of the church. The question really became about truth. The scientists could just stay quiet and ignore what they believed was true, or, like in the movie The Matrix, they could take the red pill and explore new ideas and really a whole new world. Most people kept their mouths shut, but a few brave men pushed science forward. Oh man, I love this song. If these men were going to start a new way of study, they needed some rules, so they created the scientific method. Before this science was simple. You just took whatever the church said was true and accepted it. The scientific method though, says first you come up with an idea or hypothesis. Then, you go out into the world and observe how things happen. Then, when possible, you design an experiment and test your idea out. Italy of the 17th century is a far different place than today. 
The country is divided into autonomous city-states in the north, papal-controlled territory in the center, and monarch-ruled kingdoms in the south. In this overwhelmingly Catholic land, the Pope holds authority over all. But the church is being tested by a new age of discovery. The 1600s are a time of tremendous tension and intellectual ferment. You have on the one hand the traditional sense of the order of the universe enforced by the church. And you have all these new discoveries. You have the discovery of the new world. You have new instruments. You have new techniques. You have new industries. In spite of the innovations of the era, the ancient teachings of Aristotle, dating back to the 4th century BC, are the bedrock of conventional wisdom. Aristotle's view of the heavens puts Earth at the center, with the stars and planets revolving around it. This geocentric worldview seems to be supported by the Bible. The Bible makes reference to the Earth having been created and set on its foundation not to be moved forever. By the time you, you reach the age of Galileo, Aristotle has been the platform for knowledge for centuries. When somebody has been presented for such a long period as the ultimate authority in absolutely everything, um, it takes a lot of work to take that apart. The first person to present a viable alternative to Aristotle's geocentric worldview is a Polish astronomer named Nicholas Copernicus. In 1543, he proposes a heliocentric view of the world, with the sun, not the earth, at the center. I hope it wasn't too sophomoric for you. Okay. Let's get back to the PowerPoint. The main thing I really wanted you to get there was the fact that we today have had a hard time believing how important religion was because the area that we're studying was Catholic, predominantly Catholic. And you have a few people that weren't, but they would be Hebrews or Muslims, and most of it was Catholic. And you, you live to die because your life was so bad now, and everybody said how much better it's going to be when you die and get to heaven. And who could stop you from going to heaven? A local priest, the pope. Uh, all these people had a direct ear of God. So you, you almost have to believe. But the medieval scientists, as it was pointed out, uh, based on things from Aristotle, where the earth was the center, and you do definitely need to know the difference between geocentric and hedocentric. Geocentric is the earth-centered theory, and hedocentric is the sun-centered theory. The authority of the ancients, as Aristotle and Ptolemy, uh, the heavenly bodies orbit in a hierarchy of spheres. And heavens and earth are composed of different types of things like uh, the ether, the earth, the air, the air, the fire, and the water. And God, of course, is the prime mover. But late Middle Age developments, uh, well, the things that we're finding now, they just don't conform to what we're seeing. Roman calendar is out of alignment with the movement of the heavenly bodies. And how come they don't move the same all the time? I mean, when are we going to have Easter and other holy days? And the Catholics are noted for their holy days. He entered Nicholas Copernicus. He was what we call a Renaissance man, and he said the, Ptole the Ptolemaic system had become way too messy. And he based his system on mathematical calculations, and he believed he was restoring a pure understanding of God's plan. But he was a little bit troubled by its implication because he's not a priest, he's not a monk, you know, is, is he sure he's doing God's work? And there were new problems and inconsistencies, and as pointed out, sometimes you make an advance accidentally, sometimes what you're thinking is going to be great is not worth the paper it's written on. But he wrote on the revolutions of the heavenly spheres in 1543, and he was published right before his death. Enter Tycho Brock, and these names are on your list. He was Danish. Uh, he was a champion of observation. He didn't believe in accepting what people said. Look yourself. He built his own observatory, and he spent 20 years charting the movement of the stars. Now, he was not a Copernican. He did not believe entirely in what he said. He said the planets orbited the sun, but the whole of which orbited a stationary Earth. So he's still saying that the Earth isn't moving, but the other everything else is. He was a court astronomer to Rudolf II at Prague, and he was assisted by a young mathematician named Johann Kepler, who's the next name on your list. 
He said everything had been created according to mathematical laws. He was a mathematician from the word go. He said mathematics was the language of God. And mathematical perfection and musical harmonies were the same. When they were in tune, they were beautiful. He said there's three laws of planetary motion, and you do need to remember these. He said planets travel in elliptical orbits. The speed of the planet that's traveling varies with the distance it is from the sun and its magnetic forces that keep the planets in orbital motion. So he's breaking down the distinctions between the heavens and the earth. And his writings revised and augmented Copernicus theories. Enter Galileo, the next name on your list. A very popularizer of the non-Aristotelian approach to science. He said it's a new relationship between religion and science. We can get along. Controversy, and of course there's going to be a collision with the course of the church, because the church, the church did not go quietly into the distance with these new ideas coming along. So he needed to have someone supporting him. He can't be working a 40-hour-a-week job and doing all this observation, so he needs a patron. But he didn't like the university officials and authorities, so he went to the princely courts and took a position as a tutor to one of the Medicis. And he built his own telescope in 1609, where he began to observe the features of the moon, the moons of Jupiter, and, and, and some sunspots. And it came up to be a challenge to heavenly perfections. If there's sunspots, it can't be perfect, right? Conflict with the church, of course. A Dominican monk denounced Galileo's ideas as a dangerous deviation. And in a letter to the Grand Duchess of Christina de' Medici, He's trying to defend himself. He says, one can be a sincere Copernican and a Catholic. He said, understanding the physical world is the best left to the natural philosophers. And two years later, the Inquisition declares him heretical, especially the idea that the earth moves. Copernicus's, Copernicus' book, The Revolutionists, is placed on the index of prohibited books by the Catholic Church. A dialogue concerning the two chief world systems was placed on a band of books not to read. And then he was ordered to stand trial in 1633. Where under threat of torture and some of the things you saw in the film, he recanted his belief and he was placed under the house arrest for life. But he says it still moves. Here is just a picture of him before the Inquisition. Like I said, the theory is that you're guilty before you're ever brought before the Inquisition. The theory of inertia, the law of falling bodies, and two new sciences. The sciences combine discovery, observation, experiment, and mathematics. And it's a suggestion of universal laws of motion. The new science moves out of Italy to Northwest Europe. Prior to this time, Europe has just been on the cusp. They haven't really been leading. All this is coming from Northern Italy. Galileo, oh, we went the wrong way, I'm sorry. What about Galileo the man? He was, uh, oh, we already did that. I'm going the wrong way, aren't I? On well, Judy. Okay. James Usher. I don't believe his name is on your list, uh, but he publishes a date, a book dating the earth based on calculations, and the information he got was from the King James Version of the Bible. Using the Bible as just one source uh, was a departure from truly pretty, purely religious approach because before you're supposed to use just the Bible in the church. But the discovery of fossils uh, began to challenge the commonly held positions about the age of the earth, where it's not just 6,000 years old because we've got bones and things that prove to be more than that. Nicholas Steno publishes a paper in 1667 on a shark tooth. He said, found this way far away from the sea. Uh, it's kind of like when I was lived in Kansas, we found seashells out in the farmland. And you go, how in the world can you find seashells and remnants of fish in a sandy soil this far from the ocean? Because once upon a time, the um, ocean at least reached that far inland. Robert Hooke emerges at the same conclusion of different stratas of the earth or different ages. We weren't all at one time. So you're beginning to question uh, if God created the earth in seven day, or six days and rested on the seventh, uh, did he just go like Samantha from Bewitched, poof, and there you've got earth, and poof, there you've got land? Or is God's days hundreds of thousands of years long? You don't know. 
I hope this one comes up quicker than the other one did. So it's not going to be the lecture that's so long it's going to be waiting for the films to come up. I think we're moving a little bit faster. I think this was going to show you, a, this one I think it is, is going to show you a hilarious view of one of our scientists. No, I think it's going to be part two of the scientific revolution. Hello. Yes, Welcome to part two of the scientific revolution notes for Mr. Roden. In today's show, we'll be talking about Galileo and Isaac Newton. Galileo, Galileo, Galileo. Wow, that was weird. Galileo was another great scientist. He continued the ideas of Copernicus. Here's a little bit about his background info. In 1564, his father was a professional lute player, but due to a lack of demand for top lutenists, was forced to trade in cloth. He ensured, however, that his son benefited from his full attention, and by the age of ten, the young Galileo excelled at the lute. Initially, Galileo wanted to become a monk, but his father, who couldn't afford for his son not to have an income, persuaded him to become a doctor instead. So, at the age of seventeen, Galileo began studying at Pisa University, where he became obsessed with the study of Euclid and Archimedes. By now, he had grown into a large, flame-haired rabble-rouser, enjoying fine wine, good living, and poking fun at people. He loved Galileo wanted to observe closely how the planets worked. There was no way to do it. He heard about a toy that let you see farther called a spyglass. He got one and messed around with the lenses and created a more powerful device known as a telescope. He used it to study the planets closely. He noticed for one thing that Jupiter had its own moon, and that moon moved in a circle around Jupiter. That meant that the Earth wasn't special in its design, other planets could be central bodies as well. Always fascinated by new devices, Galileo heard that a craftsman from the Netherlands had found a new use for common eyeglass lenses. The first telescope to reach Venice was a toy, a novelty, built to amuse partygoers. Spectacles, compared to telescopes, are very low-tech, but they had been around for several hundred years. It was only when lenses became available in certain range of strengths that one could take the weakest convex lens and combine it with the strongest concave lens and get an appreciable magnifying effect. Galileo set out to turn the Dutchman's toy into a useful device. Hearing reports of a new invention from a lens maker in Holland, I determined to fashion a device for myself and was able to make considerable improvements in it. Galileo realized that spectacle makers could not give him the lenses that he needed in order to make this device more powerful. They just weren't good enough and they weren't uh, the right strength. And so. In order to improve the instrument, he had to teach himself to grind lenses. And that is extremely difficult, and it, it certainly was in 1610. At first, Galileo was only interested in the optics of the telescope. With his improved lenses, he increased its power tenfold. But his lenses did more than magnify. By reshaping these pieces of glass, Galileo would eventually reshape our view of the world. With his telescope, Galileo first set out to make some money. The naval arsenal of Venice was the greatest in all of Europe. What if the arsenal had a way to spot enemy ships hours before they appeared in the harbor? Wouldn't this give the Navy a distinct advantage? Installing his new device at the top of St. Mark's Tower, Galileo arranged persuasive, 
real-life demonstrations. Numerous gentlemen and senators more than once climbed the stairs of the highest bell towers of Venice to observe vessels so far away at sea that two hours and more were required before they could be seen by naked eye without my spyglass. From within the Venetian Senate came a handsome order for Galileo to supply the arsenal with spyglasses. Galileo was given a generous lifetime salary for his service to the Republic. Part scientist and part self-promoter, for now, his future seemed bright. But soon, his telescope would launch a dispute which would threaten to destroy its creator. Galileo wrote a book in 1610 to document his findings from his telescope. He wasn't as afraid as Copernicus, because the church had been weakened, only slightly, during the Reformation. He also believed that the Pope would support his ideas. He was wrong. The church refused to admit that they were wrong. Galileo even invited them to use his telescope to see the moons of Jupiter for themselves. Many came to look but all said nope, we don't see it. They argued further, and asked him if the earth is moving like you say it is, why can't we feel it? Mr. Smarty Pants. Galileo then changed his focus, and started to design some experiments to help explain motion. The story goes that after a particularly impassioned argument with an Aristotelian lecturer, Galileo set out to demonstrate once and for all that objects fall to Earth at the same speed regardless of their weight. He mocked anyone who disagreed with him. In practice, that meant most of his lecturers. He decided to drop two different sized cannonballs from the top of the Leaning Tower of Pisa. This would surely settle the matter once and for all. Clutching his irregular balls, he climbed to the top of the tower and tossed them off. They landed on the ground at virtually, but not precisely, the same moment, and the crowd was left divided. No one could agree whether Galileo's balls had dropped at the same time. Tell me when you get a good picture, Joe. 370 years later, David Scott tried the same experiment on the surface of the moon. By repeating the experiment in a vacuum, Scott confirmed what Galileo had argued. Well, in my left hand I have a, a feather, in my right hand a hammer. And I guess one of the reasons uh, we got here today was because of a gentleman named Galileo a long time ago who made a rather significant discovery about falling objects in gravity fields. And I'll uh, drop the two of them here and hopefully they'll hit the ground at the same time. How about that? Falling balls, swinging pendulums, what does it all mean? Galileo was overturning 2,000 years of scientific orthodoxy. And he was doing it not just by observing the natural world, but by carrying out experiments with the help of new scientific instruments, which he himself was developing. Bet you never thought of Galileo as a scientist, did you? Drinking and memorizer, <laughs> running around beating up people because they didn't agree with him. Uh, you've got to realize that people in history <laughs> were not on a pedestal. They had human emotions like everybody else. They got angry. They were in love. They, you know, they were happy. So think of them like that. Don't think of them as just long dead people with strange ideas. Francis Bacon. Well, he's also on your list, and he's. His Lord Chancellor to James I of England, which was the first king after Queen Elizabeth died. He tried to get to meld the ancients and the moderns and separation of scientific investigation from philosophical argument. And this is going to call, be called the inductive method. It combined evidence from observation to draw general conclusions and encourage cooperation between researchers. Instead of being jealous and afraid somebody's going to steal your idea. René Descartes was an intellectually restless man. He began as an essay, uh, the discourse on method, but began as an essay on optics, ge geometry, and meteorology. He should systematically doubt of everything till you arrive at a place that one could not doubt. And I'm not going to try to say it uh, cognito, I think, therefore I am. 
De Curtis knew that he could think and that he could consider his doubts and that proved to be a fact beyond doubt. So the thinking person exists, reason exists, therefore God exists. Oh, rather deep. The deductive method is a fresh start for knowledge as it proceeds logically from one certainty to another. And you're going to use mathematical thought and expression is of the highest standards of reason. He is another mathematician. A mechanical philosophy is nature as a machine. Here we go back to God created the earth's clock. Reject the medieval distinctions between the works of man and those of nature. Well, now that that's, could be hard. Go toward a new conception of matter of nature and natural laws. Well, what exactly are natural laws? So within a century or a hundred years of Bacon and Descartes, intellectuals were divided loosely into two camps. Those who followed Descartes came, became known as the Cartesians, but the followers of Bacon. Cartesians were mostly in France and Holland. And instead of experimentations in various fields, they turned instead to mathematics and logic. Blase Pascal, Pascal uh, probability theory, invented a calculating machine long before we have him today. He was very religious and he believed in theology. Christian Huygens, with the problem of impact and orbital motion, which caused problems. Baruch Spex applied geometry to ethics. So you've got all these mathematicians are going to get involved now. The Baconians began with practical research for the results that they could be debated. They wanted empirical laws based on evidence. Now William Harvey studied the circulation of blood by dissecting live animals. Of course, they wouldn't be alive much longer after he dissected them. Robert Ball, Boyle's Law, Robert Hooke introduced the microscope, the cellular structure of plants, and still again, we're going back to God as a clockmaker. Many saw discoveries via the microscope and demonstrated the complexity of design by God. So we're still maintaining our religious beliefs while we're trying to understand all these new scientific inventions. The Royal Society was granted a charter in 1662 and it was committed to experimental and collaborative work. It served political and intellectual purposes and it was a common sense of purpose, you know, getting together and sharing our ideas. They published something called the Philosophical Transactions in 1665, and they reached out to other professional scholars in Europe to try to get them to contribute. That was the English Royal Academy. The French Academy of Science published a journal two months before the English. A state-sponsored framework for scientific endeavors, uh, easing the exchange of information and theories. And basically the same thing. They're getting people together. They're discussing, they're exchanging ideas, they're combining ideas, and they're trying to come up with other ideas. But they were all male. Francois Pollion de la Mar said the mind has no sex, but, and there were women professors in some European universities, but Italy, no. Elsewhere, women had to educate themselves by being with their fathers, with their husbands, with their brothers. And they critiqued those who excluded them from scientific debate. Maria Winkleman continued her husband's work in their observatory after he passed, but he, she was refused admission to the Berlin Academy of Science because she was a woman, even though she had made a lot of contributions. Maria Sibylla Moran informed informal apprentice to her father, and she'd studied etymology. She traveled to the Dutch colony of Saran and wrote The Metamorphosis of the Insects of Saran. A very bright woman, but she was a woman. Sir Isaac Newton. He's the last name on your list. I said he reflects the culmination of the scientific revolution, and he was born to a family of small landowners. He was kind of lower middle class, I guess you'd say. He studied at Trinity College where, in Cambridge, where he stayed for 35 years as a professor. Reclusive, secretive, and obsessive man. He never married. He didn't have friends. He didn't like people. He used optics as prisms to demonstrate that light was composed of different colored rays. He used mathematics to be integrated in different calculus, differential ca calculus. He's the one we know by the apple falling out of the tree, gravity. He creates the first reflective telescope, and he was elected to the Royal Society in 1672. He's kind of the last big good thinker. He wrote Philosophical Transactions, which claimed science had to be mathematical, and he criticized Robert Hooke for being too dogmatic. Uh, his work was generally well received by astronomers and scientists across Europe, but he not the man, his work. 
Hook's criticism led Newton to become reclusive and unwilling to share any of his discoveries. He got so paranoid at that point, he didn't even want to tell anybody what he was working on. The principle of mathematics, or Mathematic Principles of Natural Philosophy, was a very long, hard-to-read book. And he tried to avoid any critique from anyone else. He'd been kind of encouraged to write it and to publish it, and it was published in 1687. And it built on the works of Galileo, Kepler, Boyle, Descartes, and Hooke. And he even said that he stands on the shoulders of giants in the past. Now, gravitation was a universal force that could be expressed mathematically, he believed. A simple, single, descriptive account of mass and motion and the laws of gravitation. And of course, it was all critiqued by the Cartesians. General Shulam answered objection to the principate, especially that his theory failed to explain what caused gravity or smacked of mysticism. Well, you know, it's kind of hard to explain gravity. It's kind of like it's hard to explain God. If you can't see it and feel it and touch it, it's kind of hard to do. And I don't think any of us is, well, I think when we fall, we kind of define the laws of gravity, but you don't touch gravity. It's really difficult, especially for the uneducated to even understand anything these people are saying. Newton's legacy was certainty and objectivity lay in the precise mathematical characterization of phenomena. There again, mathematics. He was popularized by uh, John Locke in France. He was, when he died, he was buried in Westminster Abbey in the Pope's couplet. Voltaire, which we'll get into in the next chapter, spread Newtonian ideas to France. And the French female mathematician, Emilia du Châtelet, translated the principle into French. The science was going to stand for what it meant to be modern. Science was a justification for Western expansion of the empire. Because this is during the, uh, uh, the uh, voyages of discovery, discovering new lands and new peoples and new ways of life. New answers to fundamental questions. New approaches for amassing and integrating data and information because of your universities and your uh, places where the, the doctors, the scientists met. Science and scientific institutions are going to spread throughout Europe and the New World. Of course, mathematics is assumed a much more central role. And the focus is going to shift from why does something happen to how does it happen. You're going to observe, form an opinion. So Newton's legacy is certainly an objectivity laid in the precise, well, we just did that. I hit the wrong button. Aha! This concludes the lecture slide set for chapter 16. Uh, now you will notice in D2L that there is a quiz after these chapters. a quiz after each chapter, as a matter of fact, unless there's going to be a test. So chapter 16, 17, and 18 will have quizzes behind them, and after we do chapter 19, we'll have a test over those four chapters with not a quiz on 19. It's a very short quiz. It's 10 multiple choice questions. It's basically just to keep your brain gray cells stirred up a little bit. You've got 30 minutes to complete them uh, from the time you start. Uh, everything is due by Sunday night at 1130 p.m. Uh, if you've got any questions, email me. I'll be more than happy to help if I can. But like I said in the beginning, uh, if you print out your word list and make notes as we're going through the lecture, it's going to help you a great deal. That being said, thank you.